The Ash, Lutzi and Susie Snackbox. Morning, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Uh, we got you, David. Hey, mate. What's going on? Not much. How are you? <laughs> Where are you? Or is it a secret? No, no. I'm just. I'm in LA for the week, doing some stuff over here. But uh, business as usual. What's happening there? All right. He doesn't want to talk about. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> shut that down. Yeah, What's no, going I'm, on? No, I'm, I'm looking at some. Uh, no, you had your chance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try and make us draw it out of you. <laughs> what are you doing? What are, what are you doing? Oh, I'm in LA. No, I'm checking out some of the 2028 Olympic venues, which I haven't seen yet. So I'm uh, be doing the show from here for a week. Nice. In my old stomping ground. You've, yes, got an Oli- you've got an Olympic shirt on too. I like that. I do indeed. Moscow, 1980. <laughs> What's happening there? Uh, it's a bit overcast again today. Oh, dear. A bit sprinkly of rain. Yeah. Good is weekend? It, is it, yeah, I had a great weekend, actually. I was just around, you know, I didn't do anything like you, flying to LA, but just, um, what did I do? I went to that farm stay. Mm. I went to that farm stay at uh, Oh yeah, Paradise Country. Mm. Paradise Good. Country. Paradise Country. Okay. Yes. Where, okay. Remind me again where that is. It's like, it's at the back of, it's behind Top Golf. Right. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. Which, okay. incidentally, yeah, I did yeah, last yeah. night as well. <laughs> so, mm. Oh, nice. Great weekend. Yeah. <laughs> but it's very cool. That, that was really cool. Yeah, I saw some So there's animals stuff. and things. Yeah, they do, uh, they do like animal feeding and all that type of stuff, and it's like a full buffet dinner and breakfast, and it's really cool. It's very you milk cool. Some cows? It's, 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 what's that? Mm. Dingoes. There's heaps of dingoes. What's that? <laughs> did you milk the cows? Yeah, they did all of that. I, I missed that. I had golf on Saturday, so I, I, I missed all of that stuff. But um, do they have fires there? You can sit. Can you sit around fires? Yeah, we did that Friday oh, night fun. as well. It was fun. What was the ecom like? The tenting, glamping. Yeah, well, glamping at another level because you've got like um, like it's like wooden floors in the tents, and you've got your own bathroom and uh, mm. you know, double bed, bunk beds. Yeah. So we had oh, nice. We had uh, Jody, me, me and Jode, and then uh, we had. Our two nieces, Mara and uh, Farrah and May, and Archie. Oh. Yeah, all together, so it was good. <laughs> That's cute. Unreal. Sounds fun. What well, did you say? Me, yeah. Me? I had a ladies' lunch. Oh. Mm. Actually, it was fun. Went from 12.30 to midnight. Oh. <laughs> oh wow. It's a long oh, lunch. Uh, yeah. Two people cried. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, my God. Crazy. Emotional. <laughs> An emotional what, roller coaster. What time did the tears start? The tears started quite early. The tears were at, um, geez, I didn't look at my watch. I would guess 4, 4 p.m. 6. 4 p.m. Oh, 4? Oh. 4 p.m. Then we, oh, my goodness. It's still daylight. <laughs> There's three still wines up, deep. There's still eight, eight hours left after the tears <laughs> arrived. <laughs> Where do you go from there? Home. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the place next door, anyway. <laughs> the Ash Lutzi and Susie snack box. Do you guys have possums at your place? I, I, nope. We yeah. moved suburbs about four years ago, five years ago now, I think, and I hadn't seen one of these things. I thought they were just at our old suburb, but they've turned up at our new suburb. A possum. I remember oh. I actually like blocked, got someone to block out my um, ceiling. Because they were getting in at my old house. Yeah, that's the same with our other then, old house. Yeah, and then I actually put, had the very. I'm a very brave person. I, I got the step ladder and went yes. up to that little manhole, you know, in your in your hallway. Yeah. Man and like hole. you know, <laughs> lifted the lifted the manhole thing. Yeah. And you know, poked my head up like yeah. you know, scared, absolutely scared shitless. Yeah. And then looked around, couldn't see it, and then turned my head, and there it was, dead, right next to my head. I, f- I fell off the ladder. I fell off the ladder. <laughs> like, <laughs> screamed. Couldn't you smell it? It wasn't a, it wasn't a manhole. Mine wasn't called a manhole. I don't know what it was called. Yeah. It was called a, a scaredy cat hole. A scaredy cat hole, yeah. <laughs> no, well, um, mine, mine was alive. It's my, gross. My possum. I was at, uh, in a, it was just at home. It was dark and I had my headphones on so I couldn't hear outside but the door was open and I heard some, we got rocks outside our door and I heard something moving in the rocks and I actually just thought it was Cliff coming home from work. Like, you know, when people walk... He, for some reason, not on the path, just on the rocks. Mm. I was like, oh, yeah. where's Cliff? And I took my headphones off and I couldn't see him. And I was like, oh, no, maybe someone's going to abduct me. <laughs> or, <laughs> you know. Yeah, as you do. <laughs> maybe someone's going to kidnap me. But I could, then I looked down and there's a little possum right at the door. 
And it kind of looks cute at that point. Like, <laughs> But I'm thinking, I oh, know, you're not cute. Have you seen the claws on those things? Oh, yeah, they're I don't f- like them. They're little things. They're native, but I don't... I don't I'm going to say yeah. I don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> if you were abducted, would the, would would yeah. Cliff then come and rescue you like old made in those movies, Taken? Oh, I haven't seen that movie, but I, I hope so. I have a very What's specific set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. The Ash and Susie Snackbox. Elon Musk has been really interesting to be following for the last couple of weeks. He's been really vocal in his support for Donald Trump. Mm. I saw him on stage the other day with Trump. Yeah. And the memes around it. <laughs> yeah, just see him dancing. And then they've turned him into a cheerleader. Yeah. They put a cheerleading <laughs> outfit on him. Mm. And um, and then that podcast, Mitch and I have been listening to this podcast um, on the US election. That, that They say that Donald Trump can't stand mm. Elon Musk. Mm. But what? He just enjoys his support because, um, yeah, Elon Musk is fully on board with Trump. But anyway, so Elon's got all of that going on, plus he owns X. But this morning, his spaceship company... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. His spaceship company, SpaceX, which he started in 2002, by the way, so it's mm. been going for a couple of decades. But um, this morning has been history-making because he, he launched one of his Starship rockets uh, on a test flight... And it's marked a major engineering milestone because they've been able to catch the booster rocket back on the launching pad mm. from which it took off. Yeah. Have you seen this? It's No, I've seen about this. Is, are they going to rescue the, the couple that are up there, stuck up there? Is that uh, why he's going up to the space station? I think this is test flight stuff because oh, I, I, before I, that. I think that they're looking at actually putting people back on the moon in 2026. Okay. But one of one of the obstacles that they faced is that these booster rockets, you know, the, the rocket will launch, you'll see it launch, and then the capsule separates from the, the mm. booster rocket. The booster rocket then is lost to the ether, whether it comes down to Earth or, mm. or whatever. I saw that in I Dream of Genie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep going. Um, well, he's, he's somehow or other developed the technology that the, the actual booster rocket, which is like 120 metres long, so it's... It's huge. Mm. Uh, it goes up. The capsule separates from the the booster rocket, yep. and then the booster rocket returns back down. This was in Texas this morning. Returns back down, and then is caught by these sort of metallic arms. Mm. I saw them on the news and, referred to as chopsticks. Yeah, well, that's yeah, what it looks like. Up, yeah, is, is chopsticks, and it comes down, and I don't know how it does it, but it comes back exactly from where it launched, and then it's safely secured. And it saves, it means that you can recycle these booster rockets and you can use them over, potentially use them over and over again. But you have to imagine that it just takes us one step closer to being able to travel. To, regularly. Like, regularly. Like, mm. uh, you know, I mean, he, he's not mucking around. He's looking at taking people back to the moon in 2026. So usually that'd be wasted. And a lot of, they'd have to get in, build a new one. Yeah. So you'd be one flight and done, but now he's actually mm. and they've, he's had uh, attempts that have failed before. But if you get to see the vision of it, it's just it. It looks out of, like it's out of a Hollywood movie or something, and that it's it not doesn't real. look real, does yeah. it? It, it no. looks like they've just reversed the film, and, yeah. and it's a shot of it taking off, and they've just reversed it because the way it comes yeah. in, yeah, it doesn't even come straight down. It so it comes in on an angle, and then somehow just like a homing pigeon <laughs> lands on exactly the same spot. Like what on earth? Literally. Yeah. <laughs> the Ash Lutzy and Susie snack box. I was thinking, I actually kind of go out with my kids a little bit. And how different it is our generation that there's no way when I was my kids' age, they're 18 and 20, that I would have gone out with, <laughs> gone out with my parents to any... No way. No way, hey. You're right. How, now, that's, a, that's an absurd proposition for hey, me. That I, yeah. I would have gone um, out to whatever my mum and dad were going to at that, at that time. Yeah, but now, and I'm not unusual, I don't think. Like I've got other friends, like well. Bonnie who does the... <laughs> I'm not that unusual. Like Bonnie who gives us the Maui gyms. I know she goes yeah. out with her daughter. Um, I got heaps of friends. It's like a, it's a kind of a generational thing. Are we? Do you reckon we're trying to cling on to being younger, or we're not as embarrassing for our kids? Or anyway, I, was I don't at, know. I was at this ladies' lunch. I told you I went to on 
Saturday that was excellent. Started at 12. Went till midnight. Went to midnight, but at about. Tears at 4 p.m. Two, two lots of tears <laughs> at 4 p.m. The age, the age um, spread of that uh, lunch was, I think the youngest person was 28 and the oldest was probably 60. Um, but at the end of the night, the 28 year old was still there and I was there and a couple of others. And she wanted to go out because she's 28. And she's like, do you want to go out? And I'm like, well, okay, maybe, <laughs> not really. And I said, well, maybe I'll see what my kids are doing. They'll be going out somewhere. We can go out with them. So I immediately text both Alex and Bill. I'm like, are you guys going out? And Bill's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going out, but not until not until 10.30. That's the other thing that's changed. They, it's like, yeah. it's kind of, like I never would have gone, oh, I didn't go out much, but people wouldn't have gone out at 10.30 when they were 20 back in the day, would they? 10.30 at night. I don't know. Like I, my only experience of some friends of mine uh, from Vloom, actually, they went to a house party. It was the 21st. I think they go to the parties first mm. and then might go out later once they're you know, fully lit. Yeah. That maybe to save money. But did we do that? Yeah, that's remember. a good point, actually. Yeah, but Bill was like, yeah, yeah, we're going to go to um, Mr. Percival's at about 10.30. Okay, Ooh. that sounds good. And then Alex goes, well, I wasn't planning on going out, but if you want to go out, I'll go out. I'm like, oh, that's pretty fun. And then she goes, is dad driving? Can he can he come park oh. past and pick me up on the way and drop me out? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought it was funny. And so we and started, did he? No, we started getting fired. I'm like, yeah, let's go out, let's go out, let's have another drink. And, and then we're like, oh, can't be bothered. Can't be bothered going out, but I'm not, but made me think because I was thinking also back to Bill's 18th last year. We still feel really bad about this because it's he's 19 in a couple of weeks on November the first. But it was at the Noosa trial weekend on the Friday, yes. And we went to dinner with him, and then we dropped him back at the surf club, and we found out that night he went out with his friend, but also his school friend's dad. And then, yeah, and then but we'll, didn't, I, didn't I get drunk with him that night? It was one of the well. first. You were there yeah. as well, Lutzi. At, uh, at um, that jack, what's it called? Uh, Something jack. Yeah, that one up high above the, yeah. near the roundabout. We end, up, we end up there. I think I got cut off, but, which is embarrassing <laughs> in front of Bill. You got cut off. But remember, it was like another, remember. remember another dad went, and then the next day we were thinking, oh, yes. so slack. Like as, well, especially Bill. I said to him, especially Cliff. Like I said, I was okay for me because only dads went. It was a dad. It was a dad and something. But um, Cliff, you should have gone out with them. But he, Cliff goes. I thought there was no way that Bill would want to go out with us on his eighteenth. But I think no, I, like my yeah. experience with with you guys has been that it looks seamless mm. when you you guys party together, particularly at Noosa. I was hoping we get another start again. Like Cliff and Bill were getting along like a house on fire. Mm. I couldn't he, believe it. Yeah, but then he left him. He, he, he didn't keep going. You know? He didn't, he didn't you know. continue it. No, but this year it's Bill's 19th at the uh, Noosa trial. It's so funny, actually. I'm going on so many tangents. But we started going to the Noosa trial when Bill was about nine years old. So we've been having his yeah. birthday party there. You know, it started off as the pirate party and the balloons and the cake. <laughs> oh, yeah, because it's on the same time it's, every it's year. It's always on the, the same trial, weekend. It? It's, yeah. it's always his yeah. birthday weekend. And now he's like a full-grown man with a girlfriend and he's 19th and we're doing like tequila <laughs> shots. So it's such a... What's the word? I mean, we can make it pirate themed if that'll make you feel better. <laughs> it'll still work. The Ash Lutzi and Susie Snackbox. Ant Middleton joins us now. I don't know that we've ever spoken to Ant on the show uh, before, but he's a very interesting person. He's a former commando and uh, he was chief instructor on Who Dares Wins, the SAS show. Uh, over in the UK and here in Australia as well. And he's got a new show out, which is called Killer K2, about his climb up the second highest mountain in the world, which sounds very interesting. Mm. Uh, are you there, Ant? We got you, mate. I'm here, loud and clear, guys, loud and clear. Coming in loud and clear. Mate, before we get into this, can, can you talk to us a little bit about your, your, your military background? Like, that's how, I, I, you know, I'm assuming most of us first got to know you, but exactly what was your pedigree? Where, where did it all start for you? I joined the military at the age of 16 and 10 months. Now, the earliest you can join is 16 and 9 months, so I joined sort of as a, as a boy soldier, um, and I joined the Royal Engineers, went on to become a para, um, a para engineer. So I'd done P Company and all the arduous parachute courses. Um, I then transferred over or left the army and joined the Marines. Um, and then from the Marines, I went on to do Special Forces Selection. 
and passed to become a uh, an operator within the United Kingdom Special Forces. And then um, I left back in 2012 and then TV came and found me. And um, mm. before I knew it in 2014, I was filming the first season of SAS Who Dares Wins in the UK yeah. and it aired in 2015 and the rest is history. <laughs> What's the scariest thing you've ever done? Is it like a commando or as a marine? Um, I've done three do- um, three tours of Afghanistan. So um, as point man, point man being the first man in um, in my team, um, conducting sort of uh, tier one operations. So there was many moments um, that uh, we were, you know, put under the under the cosh, shall we shall we say, you know, in those moments of intensity and. Uh, of um of firefighting shall we say so um my life has been put on the line multiple times but when you climb um high altitude mountains or you know the 8000 there's this 14 um peaks above 8000 meters which then sits in the death zone um i climbed everest back in 2018 and then when i climbed k2 uh in 2022 um, it's a different type of, um, you know, being scared. It's a different type of uh, putting yourself or your life on the line because, you know, you never know what the conditions are going to uh, to bring. You never know what's going to happen on the mountain at high altitude. So it's uh, you've really got to stay switched on. It's a bit like being in the military where you've got your life in your own hands. So you've literally just got to stay switched on during those moments and make sure that you, you do everything with discipline and precision. I know that you said that you climbed Everest. Of course, that's the tallest mountain in the world. I did a yep. joy flight over Everest once um, out of Kathmandu. And then, uh, yep. and, and, and at the time, I was heavily, like, I was reading a lot about it. And I, I don't think until I actually saw, and, and just the day that we flew over Everest, there just happened to be a group of climbers that were based at Camp 4 which Correct. I think is the yeah. final camp before you, you go for the... Um, 8,000 metres, that's the death zone, before you enter the death zone. It, it, it seemed absurd to look out the plane window and to actually see these tents that are, that are perched on the side of a mountain. It, it was like, it was pretty incredible to, to, to look at that. And it gave me a real appreciation for the fact that things can go so wrong so quickly up there on the on the mountain and I guess as opposed to when you're in a conflict situation and you're actually fighting for something what what's it like when you're on one of these mountains and you're in the death zone like you say but you're not actually fighting for anything you're just trying to achieve something it's a different type of thing because you're the one that's choosing yep. to put yourself in this perilous situation yeah absolutely you've got it bang on there you know when you're fighting for something you've got your muckers behind you you know there's a there's a specific mission that you need to you need to uh, achieve where when you climb you know ultimately there's there's a bit of ego in there you know when you climb Everest you want to stand on the apex of the world when you climb K2 you want to climb the most technical and dangerous the most dangerous mountain in the world so there's definitely some ego climbing that's that's for sure with every mountaineer because they want to achieve and they want to say that they've they've achieved these uh, these feats but um, ego soon gets swept away when a storm comes in or, you know, when you're running out of oxygen and especially when you're in a death zone, when you're in a death zone above 8,000 metres, there's only 30% oxygen in the air. So your body, wow. where, with every step that you take, your body is slowly shutting down. That's why you've only got a certain amount of time to hit the summit and get back down again. And there's turnaround points um, that you, you need to sort of hit. If you don't hit them, then you must turn around. And this is where summer fever comes in where people have paid to be on the mountain they you know they go you know I'm, I'm only a few you know minutes behind or I'm, I'm 10 15 minutes behind and I've only got three or four hundred meters to climb in altitude but that's that's two three hours so that's where people um, become sort of put themselves in a sticky situation and they don't come off the mountain because you know summit fever hits them and they want to they want to achieve this feat by standing on the summit so unfortunately a lot of people die on K2 and uh, during Killer K2, you see, you see multiple bodies that I go past, um, fresh bodies as well. Unfortunately, um, due to you know again having that summit summit fever and um, and not listening to to your body or to to the people around you. And do they just leave those bodies there? And like if you if you die on on Everest or K2 and you're 
you know, you, you, you're in that death zone. They, they, they don't bring you back. You, you, you just stay there forever. And if so, like, like you said just then, you breeze past it. But what's it like when you walk past a dead body like that that's just going to stay there for, forever? Yeah, you haven't got the, you know, altitude does funny things to people. And when the lack of oxygen to the brain, you know, you become extremely emotional. It's very hard to make decisions. Yeah, you know, you, you're literally going at a snail's pace. You haven't got the, the physical attributes or the psychological sort of um, resilience to be able to drag these people off the mountain because, you know, that you, you're going to drain yourself and potentially um, die yourself. So when people you know, die on the mountain. If I was to go on the mountain, I would want to be left, you know, there's a sort of unwritten rule that you belong to the mountain now. And I suppose there's some peace in that and there's some, you know, there's some comfort in that um, because Mother Nature has embraced you and, and, and swallowed you up. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's, it's it's funny feeling when you go past people because you sort of look at them and, you you know, you, you've put yourself in this situation to, to really push yourself and to achieve something and unfortunately you you know you've lost out to to the mountain and such is life you know it's one of those I look at people I, I do a, I do a little prayer for them and and then I move on have you um, done any training to help your strong mindset or is there any tips you can give people to have a stronger mindset or do you think you're just born with that no I definitely think that you create it you know and it's just about putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and that doesn't mean physically that that could mean psychologically whether that's at work you know rather than you know writing an email to send it across the office you know get up and (laughs) have that uncomfortable (laughs) have that Mm. uncomfortable conversation you know put yourself in these uncomfortable situations where you're actually challenging yourself to you know to be disciplined you're actually challenging yourself to be it to be a better person so um i always liked i always say there's no growth in comfort Mm. and when I get too comfortable I get a bit complacent and when I get a bit complacent that's when things start to go wrong believe it or not so um I'm I'm quite a trial and error type of guy I like to 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 get out there to to jump in the deep end and see how I see how I get on do you reckon that um most of us like just normal people I've been following Ned Brockman for the last couple of days. I, don't uh, know. I love Ned. Oh, love, man, I had him like, on, my, on my podcast, Head Game. Oh, yeah. And, and, and by the way, we should mention uh, Ant's yeah, excellent uh, podcast, which is called Head Game. It was nominated for an ACRA. Should have won, Ant was saying, off edge. <laughs> yeah, agreed. 100% uh, should have won. Over the weekend. But yeah, <laughs> Ned Brockman. And um, I can't imagine the head noise that's been going on with him and, um, and, and the courage that he's shown. But... Yeah, just to bring it back to us, Layman, the, 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 do you reckon that most of us have no idea about what we're truly capable of? Like if we were able to whatever harness whatever that ability is to not give up as easily as most of us mm. do, like th- th- that we have so much more that we can achieve? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at everything that I do, it has that underlying message, whether it's SAS Australia, whether it's me climbing mountains, whether it's my books, my tours, that underlying message of make trying to make people realize what we're truly capable of mm. you know our full potential if we if we put ourselves in in these uncomfortable and predictable situations uh, because sometimes when you leave yourself with one option in life you'll be amazed at what you can achieve you know life is so comfortable nowadays we have multiple options mul- multiple safety nets and we sort of jump from one option to the next to try and get to where we need to be that you know the safest and the, and you know sort of a. Uh, uh, a non-conflicting route where when you leave yourself with one option and like that on the mountain you know <laughs> it's do or die or, or in combat it's do or die you know it's like Ned as well he's left he's, he's challenged himself he's left himself with one option and that's to get through this run that he's doing he he can't pull out you know in his head he's, 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 he's already marked that in his head he's got his waypoints where he needs to what he needs to achieve he's broken it down and he knows that when he goes through the hardship and suffering to get to where he needs to be the reward is on the other side and the reward is when you say wow i can do this i am capable of i can achieve this if if i really really push myself so the rewards far out outweigh the, the pain and suffering if you're uh, willing to put yourself in those situations uh, it's good stuff it's a great message mate and i'm looking forward to this uh, documentary uh, perilous journey to the world's second highest peak, but that doesn't mean it's easy because this is the most technical climb in the world, without doubt, 8,600 and 
11 metres 11. above Correct. sea level. It's unbelievable. And it's going to premiere on 7 Plus exclusively on Thursday, the 24th of October. It was great to chat to you, mate. Don't be a stranger. Ant Middleton. No, listen, thanks, guys. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The Ash, Lutzi and Susie Snackbox.